All right, family, good morning, and welcome to our Super Bowl Sunday. So good to have you here with us this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Jude. The book of Jude, right before Revelation, in case you're wondering. Right before Revelation. This is the only pigskin you need right here this morning. This is the only pigskin you need right here. Let's go. But we're going to take a brief pause from our new Exodus series to relate our Christian walk to the biggest sports event in the American sports calendar, the annual Super Bowl. Amen? And so we know what's going on here. We know what's going to happen tonight. But to most of the world, the Super Bowl actually isn't that important. Uh, the World Cup for soccer is far more important. Um, but, but guys, you know, but for Americans, the Super Bowl is a game of great importance. Now, I enjoy playing football. I played football as uh, both a linebacker, outside linebacker, and also a tight end back in uh, varsity high school days. I loved it. Uh, like Al Bundy, I didn't score four touchdowns in one game, but, uh, but no, all jokes aside, it, it was a great time. And, but now as a Christian, I understand that we have to become all things to all people so that by all possible means we might save some, amen? And so what's going to happen tonight? What is going to happen tonight? Well, we, we know, right? Large men are going to face off at a line of scrimmage. A call will be made, the, the football will snap, and bodies will collide and crash. A battle will have begun. And for four 15-minute quarters, but it'll end up being more like three hours with all the breaks in time, men are going to expend enormous energy, Herculean efforts, to, to move a piece of pig skin up and down a field of grass. In the end, one team will emerge victorious. Now, a lot of, is riding on this game. Um, millions will be watching. Uh, fortunes will be made and lost. Specifically, really interesting, unofficial estimates of sports betting are estimated to be $23.1 billion as of last week. I mean, you, you already heard, right? Our, our brother Josh did a great job in the welcome to you this morning. Um, this, this was pretty intense, guys. 65,000 people will be gathered in Las Vegas to worship the game of football. Um, tickets averaging $8,600 a seat. Imagine, $8,600 a seat. Guys, that's, that's crazy. And, that, and, and you're doing good. That, that's like the nosebleeds right there. <laughs> but of course, tonight at 6.30 p.m., you're going to have all these millions of people glued to their television sets, wondering who's going to win. Now, anyone here watch ESPN? All right, some of y'all. I know Mike Cissé does. Well, the sports pundits of ESPN always have their predictions. And long story short, they believe that the team that's going to win tonight is gonna have five specific traits. It's the team that has the greatest desire, the team that is the most disciplined, the team that has the most commitment, most focus, the team that's willing to sacrifice everything, and the team that has the greatest character, the greatest heart. That team, whoever it may be, will win the Super Bowl. Now, we understand that in football, many people play the game, but there's only a few that rise to the status of a Super Bowl champion. I mean, think about it. Just to make it into the NFL is like one in like thousands, right? Millions even. But then to make it to a Super Bowl, to be the Super Bowl champion, the best of the best. And I thought to myself, well, you know, that's a, that's a great achievement in American sports. But as Christians, we're also in a competition. We're in a competition, a fight for our souls, a, a fight for the souls of our community, a, a fight to maintain the standard of the truth. Are you with me here? And so let's consider what Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, had to say 
about this. In Jude, picking it up in verse 3. Let's see what the Bible has to say. We are a Bible church. Amen, family? We're not here just to be entertained. We're here to be equipped for the battle. In Jude, verse 3, the Bible says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to what? Contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Okay, let's pause here. You know, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, a true Christian, do you believe that you've been called to contend for the faith? Yeah. Guys, this is, this is huge right here. Do we understand what we're being called? Do we understand the spiritual battle that God is calling us to? Because the title of the message today is simply in the form of a question. Are you a contender or a pretender? Are you a contender or a pretender? A spiritual contender or a weekend pretender? That's the question for us today. Either we're on the battlefield competing or we're kind of watching from the stands. You get what I'm saying here? And if we're a true Christians family, God has called us to be professionals. Let me say that again. We're not called to be amateurs. We're called to be professionals. This isn't the Bush League. You get what I'm saying here? Last week we saw Nate give his good confession that Jesus is Lord. Are you with me here? And so our good confession needs to be our profession. Is it your profession? Is your good confession that Jesus is Lord your profession? Or not just something we do on Sundays? Because the Bible tells me right here in Jude that either we're godly or we're ungodly. Either we pervert the grace of God or we proclaim the grace of God. Either Jesus really is sovereign and Lord, or we're sovereign and Lord of our own lives. Are you with me here? And so if you're a guest here this morning, you got to ask yourself, is that your standard? Is this, what, is this what you're here to do? Because we can't allow the devil's standard to slip into the church. We're not here to pretend. We're here to contend for the faith. And so turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Who here has heard of Vince Lombardi? Anybody heard of Vince Lombardi? Here's the problem. Yep, you guys are all watching football, but you don't realize Vince Lombardi was the winning coach of Super Bowl 1 and 2. The reason why the Super Bowl trophy actually got renamed the Vince Lombardi trophy is because of him. And so he's arguably the greatest football coach of all time. Right? And so he actually did play for Washington. Yeah. He was the coach. I, I guess I got my, I'm trying, I was trying to do my coach outfit. Too. I, I didn't have any jerseys. I, I had to get a fedora, though. I was talking to, I need a proper fedora, and then, then you got it. But um, in addition to all his accolades, though, Lombardi was also known as a deeply religious man. And I wanted to share some excerpts from his famous speech. It's called, What It Takes to Be Number One. And he said this quote. He said, winning is not a sometime thing. It's an all the time thing. You don't win once in a while. You don't do things right once in a while. You do them right all the time. Winning is a habit, and unfortunately, so is losing. What kind of character do you have? What kind of attitude do you have? A winning attitude or a a defeatist attitude. And another quote he shared here, he said, every time a football player goes to play his trade, he's got to play from the ground up, from the soles of his feet right up to his head. Every inch of him has to play. Now, some guys play with their heads. That's okay. You got to be smart to be number one in any business. But more importantly, you got to play with your heart with every fiber of your body. If you're lucky enough to find a guy 
with a lot of head and a lot of heart, he's never going to come off the field a second. Running a football team is no different than running any kind of organization, an army, a political party, or a business. I dare say even a church. The principles are the same. The object is to win, to beat the other guy. Maybe that sounds hard or cruel. I don't think it is. Well, I think sometimes as Christians, we forget that we're in a battle too. We're kind of just sitting lounging around. We don't realize we are in a battle for our very souls. But who's our enemy? Well, I'm glad you asked. First Peter chapter 5. What does the Bible say here? First Peter chapter 5, picking it up in verse 8. Be alert and of sound mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls on like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith. See, when you stop standing firm in the faith, the devil has just beat you back. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You know, you think about football, that line of scrimmage, boom, when they hike, boom, it's like literally this collision of bodies, bang. You know, we also have that collision every day, don't we? We train, we have our quiet times, we spend time in prayer, Bible study, and then we go outside, boom. Are you ready? Or do you, do you get stumbled, knocked back? You're not ready to play. Your heart's not in the game. Your head is not in the game. Where are you this morning? You see, the scriptures are clear here that our enemy is the devil. And every day we face that battle to beat our body and make it our slave as we try to beat his evil schemes. Are you with me here? But the good news is if we're united with Jesus, we will overcome. We've already won. Right? I look at this and I'm like, man, Nate overcame last Sunday. And Rakia has come to overcome today. Now, here's the facts. Vince Lombardi, as great of a coach he was, he died. He died of colon cancer at 57 years old in 1970. And despite all the secular victories that he had in life, despite all the glory, the acclaim, the lights, the rings, when he was 57 years old, his eyes shut in death. And, you know, ultimately, death will beat us all. Our bodies have an expiration date. But the truth is, we also have a date where we get renewed. We also will be able to have the victory of raising from the dead in Christ. Right? Now, not everyone's going to raise in victory. Some will raise in damnation and defeat. And so that's why we're studying this out today, because unlike the yearly Super Bowl, I mean, they just play once. They do all this craziness for one year, and then there's a winner, and then that's it. You get to brag for one year, and then next year, you got to do it all over again. Our spiritual competition is continuous, and it has eternal consequences, right? And so as I was thinking about this, you know, I was like, man, the Super Bowl. How do we make the application here? Well, I have to ask myself, am I a Super Bowl Christian? Are you a Super Bowl Christian? Do you have the type of training to exhibit to be a Super Bowl Christian? Because think about it, right? So again, to be a part of the NFL is one thing. That's huge, right? When someone makes it to the NFL, it's like, I've arrived, right? I think when we make the decision to become disciples, Thank God I'm united with Christ. I have arrived. Praise God. Whew. I'm part of a team. It's, it's a unique community. But then, but not everybody's going to be a Super Bowl champion, though. Not everyone's going to get to the, the training required to be their best. Some people will make it to heaven in a mediocre way. Maybe they're just glad they made it. Some people will make it to heaven and they're going to give it all they got. But then it kind of makes me wonder, are the people who are mediocre really going to make it? 
And that made me think, I'm like, if a bunch of pagans can devote themselves to a game that despite pain, injury, challenges, for just a sake of a year of bragging rights and a diamond rings, then what can true disciples of Jesus devote themselves to despite the pain, despite the challenges, to get the crown of victory with Jesus Christ? You gotta ask yourself this morning, do you have the heart to be a Super Bowl champion? You know, turn over to 1 Corinthians 9 and we're gonna get into the points today. You know, um, what training does it take to be a Super Bowl Christian? What training does it take to be a, a spiritual contender? Well, let's see what the Bible has to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, this is a powerful passage right here, one that we know well. But we have to ask ourselves, is this what we're really applying? Because sometimes we try to justify our own way of thinking and our own way of living and put it on the Bible when it doesn't say that. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Let's look here in verse 24. The Bible reads, do you not know that in a race all the runners run? Are you running the good fight this morning? Good. But it says only one gets what? The prize. Hold on. Hold on. We, don't we all want the prize? Okay. Well, it says run in such a way as to what? Get the prize. So how should we all be running this morning? To get the price, right? Are, are we jogging to get the price? Are we walking to get the price? This needs to be like, this is like a marathon, right? Okay, it says everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Now this is very interesting because Paul right here is using uh, a sports reference to inspire us from the scriptures. If you're wondering, the Ithmian games were second in importance to the Olympic Games. Happened every two years. This is what Paul's referring to when he talks about the games. In Paul's time, it would have included what? Foot races, wrestling, jumping, boxing, javelin, discus hurling, horse and chariots, horse and chariots racing. And they would, of course, get the crown with the leaves, right? And so he goes on here. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. What does that mean? One saved does not mean always saved. You can be out there doing Bible studies with people and still not make it to heaven. We can be disqualified? Why? Because we're not running to win the prize. I just kind of think, hey, I'm good. I just hang on my merits, do what I want to do. Praise God, we don't have to think about physical running, amen? Because I know my knees are starting to, man, I'm starting to feel stuff. <laughs> but what strikes me about this passage, though, is that everyone competes, is called to compete, is called to what? Look what it says here in verse 25. Everyone who competes in the games goes into what? Strict training. So, well, that's interesting. Strict training. It doesn't just say training. It doesn't say your definition of training. Right? It says strict training. Well, I have to look it up. The Greek word, if you go to Blue Letter Bible, it's, it's, oh, it's a real, kind of, Blue Letter Bible is great. Strong's G1467. <laughs> you know the guy who says it? Strong's. Right? The Greek word is ekratolomai. Ekratolomai. Which means, check this out, to exercise self-control. Any, any people like to stay fit here? I like to stay fit. Amen. Okay, so you like to exercise. That's great. But the Bible's saying here, now you need to exercise self-control. You need to exercise self-control over your mouth. Self-control over your eyes. Self-control over your heart. Guys, self-control. This, this, is, this is huge. You can't just do whatever you want and be a champion athlete. The same applies to being a Christian. Okay, so what are some traits we got to pick up here? Point number one today. The first trait of being a spiritual contender and not a pretender 
is desire. Fire and desire. Now, this is intense. Desire. Okay, hold on. Paul is saying right here that we need to run to win. Desire means you want something. Mary, do you desire your partners? Amen. I desire my wife. That's a good thing. But you got to ask yourself, what do you desire? What do you really desire? Right? Because... A great desire is to want something so bad you can taste it, right? And so, if we're going to be Super Bowl Christians, we, there's no greater desire than to have a close relationship with God. This can't be something we just do on the weekends. We're not weekend pretenders. We're spiritual contenders, right? Let me show you a pic here. What's interesting, this guy, J. Vernon um, McGee, he's a late theologian, he's a minister. He says, what is your ambition in life today? Is it to get rich? Is it to make a name for yourself? Is it even to do something wonderful for God? Listen to me, beloved. The highest desire that can possess any human heart is a longing to see God. I just want to see God. Surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? You guys know the song. Yeah. Is that your heart? I mean, because again, either we're godly or we're ungodly. Either, either we're going to pervert the grace of God or we're going to proclaim the grace of God. Romans chapter 10. What is your desire here this morning? Because a desire for God should compel us. It should propel us to run with all that we got. When you really want to please God, you're all in. It doesn't become a burden for you anymore. It's not a burden to love my wife. Is it a burden for you to love God? See, unfortunately, instead of going for the gold, sometimes we settle for silver and bronze. We're not running for the prize. Maybe you're just running for a participant medal or something. I just want to make it. Just give me the participant medal. What's it made of? I don't know. Zinc or something? I don't know. what. No, serious. Plastic. <laughs> no, but it's it. You know, some people who profess to be Christians don't even venture too far past the starting line before they fall away. It gets too tough, too challenging. And so instead of pressing on, they get comfortable on the sidelines. You know, it's interesting. Vince Lombardi once said that, that the difference between a successful person and others is not a lack of strength, not a lack of knowledge, but rather a lack of will. It's a lack of heart. A lack of desire. That's what, that's what takes people out. It's not because they don't know the truth. They know the truth. They just lost the heart. Romans chapter 10. What does the Bible say here? Verse 1, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Is that really your desire? Do you really desire for people to be saved? I'll be honest with you, I don't have that desire all the time. I do, but I have to fight. I have to fight on my knees sometimes to give my heart to people all the time. Because people can be unlovable. People can be undesirable. Maybe you can relate. Are you with me right here? And so we all have to fight. Like, God, give me the, I got to get into the gym to go strengthen my spiritual muscles so I get swole. So I can get swole spiritually. To be able to go love these people. That's what it takes, guys. I'm no different than you. We're all in the battle together. We all have to deny ourselves to love people. But he says here, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that they may be saved. For I testify, I can testify about them that they're zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. You know, um, what's powerful here is like, we're not just going after the pagans. We got to go after the people that are religious pretenders. I think that's why, for the first seven years of Christianity in Acts, they went after the Jews. They went after the religious people. When's the last time you went after a lot of religious people? 
Because for many of them, they have the heart, but they're being led astray by false doctrines. And if we could just fix that, are you with me here? Call them back to the word of God. They could be powerful, right? And so my heart is, man, I, I want to get to heaven. I want to bring as many friends as I can with me. Everything we do should be evangelistic. Everything we do. The Super Bowl parties tonight, evangelistic. It's all about helping people to see the kingdom. Man, you guys are different. You're not posturing. You're not putting up a bold front. You're honest. You're real. This is, man, why, why are you guys like this? My church ain't like this. You get what I'm saying here? But there's a lot of religious pretenders out there. The weekend pretenders. And so we, we got to make sure that we're holding to the word of God and not just pretending. Amen. Point number two of being a spiritual contender is discipline. You need desire, but you also need discipline. I think it was Mike Tyson who said, man, you know, discipline is hating what you, what you do, but, but loving it, but doing it as if you love it, essentially. Discipline is, although you hate what you have to do, you're like, oh, but you got to do it like you love it. Now, it's funny because disciple and discipline, I mean, it's hand in hand. If you're not disciplined, you can't be a disciple, right? And so the second trait of a spiritual contender is discipline. Turn over to Romans 6 here. You know, we can have good intentions. We can have good desires, but it doesn't really mean very much if we're not disciplined about it, right? Discipline, or rather desire alone, is not sufficient to be a true contender of the faith. A lot of us want to lose weight, right? But without discipline, it won't happen. Appreciate my brother Sean, man, making it happen here. So proud of him. Keep it going, bro. Romans 6, what does the Bible say here in verse 11? In Romans 6, verse 11, it says here, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Your flesh wants to be evil. Your flesh wants to be impure. My flesh wants to be impure. Your flesh wants to what? Be deceitful, be prideful, be arrogant, be rude. That's what we want to do. How many times have you thought stuff but you didn't act on it? You get what I'm saying here? The difference between someone who's successful or spiritual is someone who's able to deny those evil desires and do what's right. Look what it says here. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. What part of you is the instrument of wickedness? Is it your mouth? There's a lot of, well, there's many parts of us can be an instrument of wickedness that we use as instruments of wickedness. Guys, this is intense. But it says, rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under law, the law, but under grace. Man, how were you used as an instrument of wickedness before you became a disciple? Think about it. I know I did. My whole body was an instrument of wickedness. My whole body was an instrument of wickedness for immorality, impurity. How did we debase ourselves before we became true disciples of Jesus? But you know what makes me so happy? Is to know that, man, in spite of that, God loved me and died for me. Like, he went to battle for me. And so... Now that I'm a true baptized disciple, washed clean, I'm like, why would I dare go back to that again after what he did for me? How can I think that way again after what he did for me? How can I act that way again after what he did for me? You know, um, I, I look at this and I realize, wow, I got to get swole. I got to get, I got to, I got to get in the spiritual gym. I got to get some gains up in here. But you gotta ask yourself, like, okay, so what are you lifting spiritually? 
What are you lifting spiritually? Seriously, how much can you handle? How much pressure can you take before you break? Do you have a spotter? Who's your spotter? Who's the person looking out for you? As you, hey, listen, I'm, I'm spotting you. I can't, I cannot lift your weights, but I can spot you. I think sometimes we try to go around and we don't have a spotter. You don't get open about the challenges in your life. You just try to go through it. And then when it falls and lands on your chest or on your neck, now you're hurt and you're wondering, oh my gosh, no one cares about me. It's your responsibility to get the spiritual spotter. You want to start lifting? You better, you better be humble enough to get the help you need. You also got to be humble. You know, my dad, um, my dad's going to turn 90 next month. Wow. And, um, amen. And, uh, you know, I remember when, you know, growing up as a kid with my dad, he's like, Andrew, come downstairs. I'm like, okay. All right, I'm going to teach you how to lift weights today. Because, you know, everyone's like, yeah, put on weights. He's like, no, 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 no. Just put on a comfortable amount. Good. Now I got you. All right. Okay, Dad. You know, he's smiling. He's like, okay. Okay. I got, I got you. Let's go. And I'm not sure if you guys have ever done bench presses. Right? But when, when, when you're about to do a bench press and you're like, and you know, you, you feel, at first you're like, okay, I'm feeling good about yourself. He's like, keep going. Right? Right? 10, 15, 20. And now, you, you know, the shake starts happening. He's like, oh. he's like, I want you to push. Push. Come on, son. He's like, I got you. And he, he puts his fingers like right there, like, like, come on, come on. You got. And, but for some reason, because his hands are there, it gave me confidence that I could do it. I never forget. And he's like, okay, now again, boom. He's like, oh, good job, son. And I remember just, you know, downstairs in the basement with my dad, lifting weights. And um, it taught me a lot. It taught me, Andrew, I used to go to the gym, and he's like, these guys will walk in. <laughs> you know when people walk in the gym, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just thinking they're spoiled, boy, right? And they go under, like, the massive weights. Like, you know, like going like 600 pounds. Like, bro. And they're all like, and they do it like, they do it like three times. And then he's like, and then, you know, he was in the British military. So you're like, oh, Sergeant Smelly. Uh, you think you can handle this weight? And my dad, you see, he didn't do like a lot of heavy weights. He just went under the 300 or 400, but he'd do it like 30 times. <laughs> So when now he came under the 60, he's like, 600, he's like, he, he just did like 10 of them. No, boom. Looked at him, walked away, you know, <laughs> like, right? And I think that was the thing. Sometimes we try to put too much on ourselves for the sake of trying to impress people. When sometimes we got to figure out how much we can really do. How much you can do well. Because if you're going to do something, then do it. But don't complain about it later. If you accept the discipline, okay, okay, I'm going to go under this weight and I'm going to lift it. You can't whine about it later. You are the one who put yourself under the weight. So if you're going to do it, let's do it. You get what I'm saying here? And so I think the challenge is, the Bible is clear, train yourself to be godly. Endure hardship. There's no shortcuts to being in great physical condition. And there's no short, shortcuts to being in great spiritual condition. But you got to ask yourself, who's your coach? Who's your spotter? Who's looking out for you? I think, sadly, discipline has become a dirty word in our culture. Um, but it's, 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 it's essential to success. You know, there's a quote by the late Tom Landry. And he was the first head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Probably one of the, amen, Cowboy fans. Probably one of the greatest coaches of all time. He said, the job of a football coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they've always wanted to be. It's true. Who's your coach? 
I'm privileged to be one of your assistant coaches. Maybe I kind of do both quarterback and assistant coach from time to time. But the truth of it is, guys, is that, that that's what we're here to do. And I, I think that sometimes there are going to be things you don't want to do. I, I want you to be open. I want you to be able to say, bro, I don't know if I can do that. I want, but you got to count the cost. You don't stop counting the cost as a disciple. You get what I'm saying here? But when you say you're going to do something, then do it. And don't complain and whine about it. You get what I'm saying right there? I think most of us want to win, but we just don't want to suffer. It's true. Most of us want to win, but we don't want to suffer, right? And so discipline is what makes us spiritual contenders. But to perform at the highest level, though, you got another trait you need. You need desire. You need discipline, right? But then you got to have commitment. You got to have commitment. You know, I think sometimes, take a look over in Philippians 3. What's interesting about commitment is that commitment is doing it even when the sun doesn't shine. Even when you don't feel like it, right? Even when somebody hurts you. I love that picture. You guys have probably seen this picture of this old married couple. They're sitting on the bench and they're mad at each other. And the guy's holding the umbrella over the wife. You ever seen that one? He's like, he's, he's looking at her like, right? And she's like, right? But he's still holding the umbrella over her. I think what happens is that when things don't go our way or we get hurt, we're like, give me my umbrella back. We push our hearts back and we stop being fully committed. Are you fully committed today or are you just showing up? Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I think commitment is a dying quality in American life. You know, my dad being 90, he taught me a lot because I feel like I have an old soul in that way. Because um, he lived through the first, through the Second World War. He lived through Vietnam. He lived through all this stuff. Generations like them, when you go through like international wars, you see people getting drafted, all this stuff, people dying, all this stuff. It changes you. Right? I mean, today's generation, they go through tough times. Ah, they want to quit. Their, 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 their challenges and suffering is like, oh my gosh, I don't have a QR code for this. What's going on? I, I have to actually, I have to actually like pop in the numbers. What, what am I going to do here? You know, I, I kind of like my old, I, I kind of like my old Benz that my dad gave me because I'm like, there's no like beep, 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 danger, danger. I have to, oh, there's no thing. I have to turn and see if there's a car to my side. I actually have to be committed to driving. I can't just sit down and let the car drive me. I have to be all in. Philippians chapter 3. <laughs> it's, it, it is. It's just laziness. It's an entitlement. Philippians chapter 3. What does the Bible say here in verse 12? Not that I've already obtained all this or, that, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Let me say that again. Forgetting what is behind. Some of y'all are stuck in the past way too much. You're, you're still living there. You're like, I mean, it's like, dude, have a birthday. It's time to move forward. It's time to move forward. Forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't deal with your past. You'll be stupid not to. Because your past projects onto your future and your present. You get what I'm saying here? People who are like emotionally immature don't like to deal with their past. Because what ends up happening is, and I've been there, is because what ends up happening is, ugh, I got to deal with that. You are your experiences. Let me say that again. You are your experiences. How do I know that? The way you talk is based on your experience. It's been with you all this time. You get what I'm saying here? The way you walk, the way you act, everything is based on your experiences. So if you don't think about why you do what you do, then you're going to keep doing the same nonsense again. Do you get what I'm saying here? You don't need a therapist to tell you that. 
Some people do. <laughs> Thanks, bro. But you know, you know but, but this is important, guys. Most people don't have the emotional toughness to be able to say, hmm, there's something wrong here. I need to fix this, but I need to deal with my past. I need to heal whatever is broken here. The problem is that there's a stigma with emotional stuff. I was just talking to a friend of mine who just came out today, and um, it was powerful because he was like, yeah, I, I, he's a retired man. He's, he's a friend here. And he was sharing how he used to be a counselor, helping people with emotional challenges, all this stuff. He's like, yeah, there's a lot of stigma because there, there's too much pride. People, they don't want to deal with it. And so they just keep doing the same dumb stuff over and over and over again. And so you look at Philippians 2, it says, forgetting what's behind, straining toward what is that, I press on towards the goal. When someone's committed, the, the conditions don't change their attitude. Guess what? I'm going to preach whether there's 400 people in the room or whether there's 40. Same conviction. I'm going to give my heart to you whether you're rebellious or whether you're accepting. My, my attitude doesn't change because of your condition. Does yours? Guys, this is huge. You're either a thermometer or a thermostat. That's it. You kind of go up and down depending upon the prevailing conditions or you are just locked in. You look at these football players, you think, you think whether it's raining, whether it's snowing, what do they do? They line up. You get what I'm saying? Raining, snowing, hail. They walk out. I remember the first time I went out, and you know, you know when you're a kid, you know, you're like, all right, time to play football. And it's like, it's raining outside, pouring. All right, guys, line up, let's go. The guy's like, what do you mean, coach? It's like it's raining outside. And he's like, get your, get your, get your burn off, sorry. Right? And everyone goes out, and we're in the rain. Hi! I mean, God, people slipping, fall, falling, people juking people. I'm like, this is crazy, right? Good. Again. Again. I'm like, yo. Right? Whether it's snow, let's go. It doesn't make a difference. There is no off season. There's no off season of being a disciple either. I think we got to get that in our heads. You know what I'm saying right here? Guys, th this is huge. And I, I think, you know, there's another quote by Vince Lombardi. He said, the quality of a man's life is in direct proportion to his commitment to excellence. A quality of a man is in direct proportion. to. See, I'm going to be excellent regardless of what everyone else does. When people come into a situation, you know, I, I think very often, guys, what ends up happening is we allow people to make us not excellent. And we justify it. Or we allow conditions to make us not excellent. Guess what? I was excellent before I got married. I'm going to be excellent when I get married. I'm going to be excellent after I have my first kid. I was excellent after I have my second kid. I'm going to be excellent when they grow up. I'm not going to stop being excellent just because my life changes. Are you with me right here? How about you this morning? But you got to be willing. You got to ask yourself what you're willing to do to do it, though. Because it ain't easy. In 1998, I know some, before some of y'all were even alive, I know. <laughs> uh, I, I was in university, and um, there's a there's a quarterback named Tony Rice. Now this guy Tony Rice, he led Notre Dame. He led Notre Dame's football team to a national championship. But what's part? That's him right there, the little one. He's the quarterback. You see how big them dudes are coming up. I mean, it's, it's these guys, are, and the offensive line is just always massive, right? But this guy was the quarterback. He led Notre Dame to a national championship. And so before the season, 
this, all the sports writers were like, man, now Notre Dame can't beat the tough teams. These guys, they got issues. And that, that, that quarterback, Rice, man, you know, his passing is it's not good. It's true. His passing was inaccurate. And so what they didn't know, though, was that the coach, Notre Dame's coach, Lou Holtz, he got something for Rice. He got him a dartboard. He's like, I want you to take this dartboard, and I want you to throw darts on it for an hour every day. Now, Rice was like, I mean, how does that help me with passing? I mean, <laughs> these guys are moving, the dartboard's stationary. I mean, what, what, how does that help? But he did what the coach said. He trusted his coach. He was committed to being excellent, even though he didn't understand. Do you trust the spiritual coaches in your life? I don't understand what you're saying to me. So I'm not going to do it. Okay. How is your way working? No, no. That, 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 I mean, that's the thing we got to really take. Like, how is your way working? Because if your way was working, you'd be teaching this. If your way was working, we'd see the fruit of your success. If your way was working, well, then we wouldn't be having this conversation, would we? So why then would we not want to learn how to be better? Guys, do you trust others in your life even when you don't understand their advice? This guy began to throw passes with so much accuracy and confidence that eventually he led Notre Dame to victory. He was inaccurate before. He trusted the process, and he became a champion. What's stopping you from becoming a champion because you're not committed enough to trust the process? You see, family, that's the difference between a spiritual contender and a weekend pretender. Another trade here for you. Fourth trade of a spiritual contender is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Again, one of those dirty words. Sacrifice. Turn over to Hebrews 12. You know, when I think about success, I think about all the ways that we have to sacrifice for stuff. Don't we as parents sacrifice for our kids? Um, yeah, we still do. It doesn't end, right? <laughs> Um, we sacrifice for our spouses, sacrifice for our families. We sacrifice for those we love. And, you know, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible reads here, as our brother Josh did, he is the spirit of God. I didn't talk to him about this. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, more than the 65,000 watching the Super Bowl today, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. The point here is sacrifice. It says throw off everything that hinders. Do you realize that you may have to sacrifice things that hinder you? You know, when this movement began in 2006, 2007, people literally took their kids out of school to move to Portland, Oregon. People literally, hey, come on, Portland. People literally move their kids, move their jobs. I remember this brother, Matt Sullivan, he's like, I'm going to work at Starbucks as a manager to make it happen for the sake of my salvation and the salvation of my family. That sacrifice. Guys, are we willing to... Thanks, bro. That was a really nice... Um, I want it back. It's really nice. You did a really good job with it. Sorry the power brought it down there. <laughs> but you know, to sacrifice is to give up something for a specific purpose. And I'll show you another quote. I got quotes for days here. Sacrifice, again, Vince Lombardi. Sacrifice, or rather success, is like anything worthwhile. It has a price. You have to pay the price to win. And you have to pay the price to get to the point where success is possible. Most important, you must pay the price to stay there. 
I think sometimes we pay the price. We're like, I paid the price. Good. But now you got to stay there. You know what I mean? It's like, I paid the price for this car. That's awesome. Now you got to pay the price to maintain it. You got to pay for gas. You got to pay for insurance. You got to pay when it breaks down. You gotta... but, I, but I thought, I, I paid the price. <laughs> it's not enough. No, you gotta, now you got to stay there, right? <laughs> and so, you know, I, I look at this and I realize, man, like, have you stopped? Because you're like, ah, I'm just going to rest on my laurels, right? No, we got to. And guys, I just want to hold up the church. I really am so proud of the way you guys have paid the price in regards to blowing out our missions contributions these past years. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful for you guys raising and, and paying the price to raise our, our, our weekly contribution family. Guys, this, if we're going to have the success here in D.C. that we need, it's going to take sacrifice. Everybody wants something great, but nobody wants to pay for it. We're not talking about debt here. Don't go into debt for that. Are you with me here? But I'm telling you something. 25 people are going to come here, God willing, in July. And Delaware, prayerfully. And they're going to have sacrificed everything to be here. Right? Very soon, God willing, we're going to see the Schaefer sacrifice to go to Morgantown, West Virginia. And you know, when I think about what other people are willing to sacrifice for, it makes me want to sacrifice. But sometimes we're not just sacrificing money. That's kind of easy, in a sense. Easier. Sometimes we have to sacrifice our pride. Sometimes we have to sacrifice the way we do things. Sometimes we have to sacrifice our traditions and just, and, and in order to be able to think differently, to be more effective. What are you really willing to sacrifice here today? It's not just money, guys. It's heart. Let's close out today. Last point is that the fifth trait of a spiritual contender is character. Now, this is interesting because you've probably heard this quote before. Winning is a habit. Watch your thoughts. They will become your beliefs. Watch your beliefs. They'll become your words. Watch your words. They'll become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. And watch your habits. They become your character. You don't just act the way you do for no reason. Your thoughts start it. This is where the battlefield starts right here. The battlefield for your mind. You get what I'm saying right here? Guys, this is huge. If you win this, you might be able to conquer this too. Although, I'll be honest with you, sometimes our hearts are stronger than our heads. And we'll do what we shouldn't do even though our head tells us don't do it. You know what I'm talking about right there. To know to Philippians 3, we're going to wrap up here. In Philippians chapter 3, this is powerful because without exception, every successful Super Bowl team has a game plan. All these different elements we talked about in their strategy. They got desire, they got discipline, they got commitment, they are focused. I mean, this, they're, they're, they are literally ready to go. But what's powerful here is that character for being a Christian is defined as being more like Christ, right? And so look at what, look at more and more like why Jesus, or rather Paul, trained so hard. In Philippians chapter 3, let's see what the Bible says here. You guys still with me? It says here in verse 10. It says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. You know, these guys who are playing tonight, they know that playbook inside and out. They're dreaming about it in their sleep. You get what I'm saying here? They, they, they know this inside and out. I'm, I got to ask you, is this how well you know your pigskin? Do you dream about, do you think about this? Man, I am ready. I am ready. Is that what you think about? Is that what you focus on? Is that where your character comes from? Because the truth of it is, guys, is that we are in this spiritual battle today called life. 
that Super Bowl called life. And tonight, a game of great importance is going to be played. My question to you is, is your spiritual journey of great importance to you? Let me say that again. You're paying attention to those lining up. Think of this. All these people tonight watching all this stuff. Why? Paying $8,600. Why? Because it's so important to them. How important is your walk with God to you? Tonight, large men are going to face off against a line of scrimmage. Okay. Have you lined up with your other brothers and sisters to defend the truth? Tonight, a call will be made. The football will snap and the bodies will collide and clash. Are you listening to the call of your spiritual quarterback as you begin to attack? Tonight, a battle will begin and for four 15-minute quarters... They're going to pour out all this energy to move a piece of pigskin down a field. Are you ready to expend the energy that it's going to take to get to the end? You know, um, my prayer, guys, is that we'll hear the, war the Lord say, well done. I'll leave you with this quote. After all the cheers have died down, and the stadium is empty. After the headlines have been written, and after you are back in the quiet of your room and the championship ring has been placed on the dresser. And after all the pomp and all the fanfare have faded, the enduring things that are left are the dedication to excellence, the dedication to victory, and the dedication to doing with our lives the very best we can to make the world a better place to live. Are we Super Bowl Christians today, family? Are we spiritual contenders? Let's make our good confession our true profession. And let's make an impact on the record books of eternity together. Amen. To God be all the glory.